Hey everyone, notice anything different? That's right, I brushed my hair. Oh, and I got these. I may have mentioned previously that I like to do woodworking. When I'm in my wood shop, I need to measure things constantly. And for this, I usually use a metal tape measure. However, if I can't find my metal tape measure, I now have a way that I could do measurements without that tape measure. I have my suspenders and they have a measurement scale on them as well. How do you think that's going to work? Well, already you're beginning to suspect that using a stretchy measurement probably is not going to be the best way to get accurate measurements. And you would be entirely right. If you and I are working in our respective shops and we each have metal tape measures, I could tell you to measure a board just like I am at 12 inches long. You measure your board and cut it, so do I. If we put those boards right up next to each other, they're probably going to be very close, but I bet they might be off by a small amount. This is a specific form of error. It's not so much measurement error. This is error caused by the one doing the measuring. The 12 inch distance on both of our tape measures is probably really close to equal. And so any variability is going to be due to the carpenter or the researcher to follow this example. On the other hand, if I am using stretchy measures, then the thing that I am measuring may not change and yet my measurement does. This is measurement error. Some measurement tools measure differently each time, even though the thing that we are measuring hasn't changed. When we find changes in the thing that we are measuring, we want to be confident that the changes that we measured are due to changes in the thing, not changes in our ability to measure. This is called sampling error. Sampling error is the difference between the sample statistic and its corresponding population parameter due to randomness in sampling. It's measured by the standard error of the mean. When we did our experimentation with standard error of the mean, everyone selected a sample of the same size. We used samples of size 30. Because the standard error of the mean uses n, or sample size, in the denominator, as that denominator grows larger, the overall equation gets smaller. As sample size increases, the standard error decreases. Increasing our sample size is an excellent way of making sure that we are measuring accurately and minimizing error. There is also non-sampling error. Non-sampling error is the difference between the sample and the population due to other factors, such as squishy measurements or missing data. It is possible that we have non-sampling error because certain individuals skipped questions on our survey. The fact that that information is missing doesn't mean that we can simply ignore it. Sometimes the most important information is the information that we are not being given. That may be the information that we most want to know. Missing data requires, first of all, knowing why those data points are missing and then having some methodology to deal with the missing data. That's something that we're going to discuss in a later lecture. Another source of non-sampling error is difficult populations, where it's hard to get responses from these individuals. I've mentioned before doing research with junior high school students. That is a difficult population. You can't trust that they're telling you the truth. In fact, in the survey that I used, I included an item at the end of the survey that said, I answered this survey correctly and I took it seriously. And I found a certain number of students who were very honest in telling me they were messing with me. They didn't take the survey seriously and so I excluded those data points. 
Another form of non-sampling error is coverage error, where the research objective and the population are not aligned, essentially asking the wrong people. So this could occur if you want to know something about one group and yet you can't get access to that group. And so you ask someone adjacent to that group, similar to, related to, however, what you learn from those individuals may not actually apply to the group that you want to know about. Here's another example of how this coverage error might occur. Here's a picture of a plane and the red dots are indicating the places on the plane where it had been struck by bullets. So this is an example from bombers in World War II. Engineers looking at this pattern said, we need to reinforce these areas because that is where these bombers are getting struck. If we reinforce these areas, it could protect the crew and allow them to return safely. But this is coverage error, because what this is actually revealing is the parts of a plane that can be struck and still return. It's those other parts of the plane, the ones that when they're struck, the plane goes down, that are more important to know about. We should be adding additional armor to the areas that have not been struck. Those are the ones that matter most. We know the best way to minimize sampling error is by increasing sample size. How can we minimize non-sampling error? Number one, carefully define your target population. Know what you want to know from whom. And then carefully design your data collection tool. Use best practices so that you're not using squishy measurements. For instance, if you're measuring a construct, don't use just one item to measure the construct. Use three or more items to measure the same construct. You will then take an average of those three items to triangulate on the centroid the true measure of the construct. Train your data collectors. Don't trust that people are going to know exactly what to do in their data collection. Make sure that you have trained them, they know what to expect and how to respond. Pre-test your data collection procedure. Do a pilot study. Run a small-scale version of your survey. Trust that no matter how much effort you have put into getting it right, you have missed something. Mr. Murphy will always rear his head. There will always be some unexpected outcome. Therefore, you should plan for that contingency. Running a pilot study, testing your survey before you roll it out in a large scale is an excellent way to minimize your non-sampling error and to make sure that you spot and fix problems before they occur. But the best way to minimize non-sampling error is to talk to your statistician early. Don't bring your completed data set to your statistician and say, here's my data, tell me what they say. Talk to your statistician before you do data collection. Involve your statistician at every step along the way for each thing that is related to your statistical analysis. I will be able to spot things that you might not be aware of and avoid problems that could sink your data collection. I've had this happen multiple times. When I work with researchers early in the process, we spot the problems early and fix them. When people show up with data they've already collected and want to know what do those data say, I'm just left trying to do the best I can. It's like you've shown up with a truckload of lumber and said, build me a house. And I've got to say, what kind of house do you want? And you say, I don't know, what kind of house can you build from these data? I'm left with squishy measurements and data that simply don't tell us what we want to know. Talk to your statistician early. That's the best advice I could give you for all forms of research.